This period is quite new. Trump has done something that never has been done before. He declared war to the establishment, to the press, and to the politically correct class. That is why the press is so furious, because until now, the unwritten rule was that no one, politician or someone else, could succeed in hers or her aims without the support of the press. That is, the world is what you call, can call upside down. Nobody disagrees with that. Until recently, in Western and Europe, Eastern Europe, the situation was the following. Politics was grosso modo dominated by two parties, uh, or two sides, the Social Democrats on the one hand, and the party from the right center, like uh, Christian Democrats, Liberal Conservatives, or Fox Party on the other hand. They were hand in glove and had no room for opponents. Now the situation is the following. On the one hand, there is a so-called capitalist party that is quite prevalent towards the right to abortion, homosexuals, and religious and ethnic minorities. On the other hand, the fast-growing and populist movement with a bunch of racist and neo-fascist influences that is firmly against immigrants. They are against globalization, against international relations, and against international contracts like NATO. They are against free market, freedom, to poor. The irony of this uh, situation is that extreme leftist parties, including Naomi Klein, meet at that point the extreme right and are hated towards uh, globalization. Trump's politics can be um, characterized by protectionism and the desire to make America big and powerful. Strength is a U in an end in himself. As we all know, protectionism means uh, other taxation on import, but it never works properly. They always leave this strategy. And, but um, Trump is determined to continue this road. For, as for the Brexit, um, the Prime Minister had a 12-point plan um, uh, presented for a global Britain, and there are more plans to come up. I think that Peter will talk about that. Um, she displayed clarity on various points. In the meantime, both Houses of Parliament have voted on the UK's final deal with the EU. She also expressed her own domestic vision for the sort of country we want to be. The British Prime Minister stressed that the UK was crucially important to the EU and Britain could play hardball if required. In the meantime, a lot has been changed. But the questions remain. What will be the legal status of EU citizens in the UK and British citizens in the EU? What will be the economic consequences? There is a new Brexit ministry in London. A great number of questions on flight rights, food and ports, judicial proceedings in the case of Brexit, immigration questions, etc. That all had to be sorted out. There was a, an economist of Alliance Burstein, Darren Williams, who said that a vote by Britain to leave the EU could make the pound 10% weaker. I don't know whether that is the case. Um, it will be quite difficult to predict. Uh, another question is how should, and that is nothing to do with the Brexit, how should Brussels and the EU establishment respond to Trump and the new administration, US administration? Why does Brussels not have an answer to Trump's constant provocations? Merkel's tactics was until now to let the opponent flounder in the vacuum. Until now that worked. But will it function as Trump? I don't know. The last point I want to touch is Europe and of course liberalism. Um, there is some news because on the 2nd of March 
the message came that Juncker has proposed five possible scenarios for the EU. And one scenario has as aim do less but better, which means that the EU member states will define the topics where they will cooperate together and repatriate uh, other powers to their home country. That breaks a taboo, because it means a scenario with less Europe and not more. And until now it was all the time more Europe. But keeping that slogan, more Europe, is not good. It's political suicide. We think that, uh, well, my slogan would be, reculer pour mieux sauter. Uh, liberalism, the meaning of liberalism in the EU is, in Europe, is changing. It takes the meaning now current in the US. The liberals are left-wing, opposed to the conservatives, conservatives which means right-wing. Joe Norberg wrote uh, on Facebook, beginning almost 15 years ago, I've argued for globalization as a positive force. When I then argued for free trade and free immigration, I was accused of being a foolish right-winger. When I say the same thing today, I'm attacked to be a leftist. So you see, yet the classical liberalism has achieved so much. An independent judiciary, the Nula Pena rule, the Nibis in Edom rule, a free press, civil rights, abolishment of uh, torture. So we have to still aim at keeping our liberalism alive and the real classical liberalism. And that certainly does not apply that I ever will belong to the camp of Le Pen, Wilders or RD. Um, I would say um, I leave it to this and I give the floor um, to Barbara and I want to mention that Mrs. Klosch has is as deputy head of the mission of the embassy in Austria is attending here and has given us a honor to be here. Uh, my name is Barbara Colm and I, am, I'm, I have the privilege to moderate the first panel here, uh, uh, the topic of which is a major economic rec uh, rec uh, reconfiguration, the end of the free trade era. Um, we have seen many ends in the past 60 years while the EU has developed to a certain extent, but I would start by quoting Frédéric Bastia, when goods cross borders, weapons won't. And I think this great uh, French uh, philosopher um, has, has made his point clear. And we should all learn from that. And I'm looking forward to have Professor Bede as a keynote speaker here uh, to open the debate. And I will uh, quickly introduce uh, our speakers at this first panel. So Professor Bede, the keynote speaker, uh, uh, is a, has studied psychology, is a sociologist by uh, academic education. Uh, studied in Hamburg, made his career via the United States, uh, um, Northwestern University in Illinois, via Mannheim, uh, Cologne, and where he, and he retired finally in Bonn. Uh, Professor Bede is a very active uh, writer, uh, disputer, and uh, joining us at the Roadshow frequently. And I would like to extend my thanks for joining you. Thank you, Barbara. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, liberty. My topic is, do we face the end of the free trade era? Free trade is under attack, and free trade has been under attack for at least a decade. Its survival cannot be taken for granted. The cues for free trade being under attack began with the failure of the Doha Round, more recently, with the failure of the Trans-Pacific and Transatlantic Free Trade negotiations. Thereafter, with the Brexit vote, which is endangering British access to the common European market. And then, with the election of a protectionist to the American presidency. I do not belong to those who reject Donald Trump for politically correct reasons. 
I think his geopolitics is saner than Hillary Clinton's might have been, but this is not my topic today. My topic today is free trade, and unfortunately, being a protectionist, Donald Trump is dead wrong on this issue. Not on all issues, but on this issue, he is as wrong as one may be. Unfortunately, politicians, not only Trump, but without exception, all politicians on the left side of politics, and many politicians on the right side of politics, know next to nothing of economics. And I would be happy if they had read and understood only the first 50 pages of the Wealth of Nations, if the basics of economics had trickled down to politicians. Let me summarize in two or three minutes what I believe to be the essence of Adam Smith. According to Adam Smith, the division of labor enhances productivity. Productivity is essential for prosperity, and productivity depends on innovation. According to Smith, the division of labor, which brings all these good things, prosperity, productivity, innovation, depends on the size of the market. Ask yourself if these statements are true. What is the optimum size of the market? And the answer is obvious. The optimum size of the market is not the European market. It's, of course, a global market. Because the global market permits the most division of labor. If we get the most division of labor, we get the most out of it in prosperity, productivity, and innovation terms. Free trade in the past did not only promote the welfare of the rich and powerful. Free trade did provide prosperity which trickled down to the poor, from rich countries to poor countries, and it even trickled down to a significant degree, with some exceptions to which I come later, within rich countries. Free trade is a prerequisite for the so-called advantages of backwardness. And the advantages of backwardness permitted poor countries to grow much faster than rich countries. The main reason for the existence of the advantages of backwardness is the fact that poor countries can borrow technology from richer countries and apply it in economies with low labor costs. There are other reasons, but I don't have time to go into the secondary reasons for the advantages of backwardness. But within the last three or four decades, the advantages of backwardness took about one billion people out of dire poverty. This, of course, was geographically concentrated. Most of the beneficiaries lived in Asia, the Chinese, of course, being most affected by the advantages of backwardness. Before them, the Taiwanese, the Koreans, people in Hong Kong and Singapore, and currently, it's the Indians, the Vietnamese, even the Bangladeshis start to benefit from it. Free trade did not only pull a billion people out of dire poverty, it also raises the standard of living of poor people in rich countries. Poor people in rich countries are negatively affected in their capacity as producers, as laborers, as employees, but they are positively affected in their capacity as consumers. Even if they survive on social transfer payments, they benefit as consumers from the availability of cheap textiles and cheap 
from Bangladesh and cheap smartphones made in China by American firms, but actually produced to a large part within China. So free trade also raises the living standard of the poor. Recently, The Economist published a study according to which poor consumers in the United States would lose 62% of their purchase power if Asian products were no longer available on the American market. Another effect of free trade and globalization in recent years has been that inequality between human beings or inequality between households in the world has been decreasing during the last decades. So if you are not interested in nations, but only in human beings or in their families, there is good news. The world has become more egalitarian. Somehow social democrats succeed in not recognizing this obvious fact. They talk all the time about the world becoming more unequal in yeah. spite of the fact that it has become more equal. Of course, it has to be admitted that the lower classes in the industrialized and rich countries have been winning less from globalization than the lower classes in Asia. And this fact made it happen that inequality in many rich countries and even in many emerging economies like China within nations has become greater. But global inequality nevertheless has decreased. And this is a fact which we should always keep in mind. Let me now move from the economic consequences of globalization and free trade to the national security consequences of it, on which I have done a lot of research. And I think it's at least two dozen publications in English on that kind of topic. It can be demonstrated by economic, econometric methods that economic interdependence and free trade promote the avoidance of war, or absentia belli, what we usually call peace. Among free traders, war is much less likely than elsewhere. Even the so-called democratic peace ultimately depends on economic freedom and free trade. To summarize, I can refer to the quote from Bastia again. The alternative to free trade is less prosperity and more conflict within and between states. Free trading countries also are less likely to suffer from civil war which recently has become more important and more a threat to human well-being than interstate war, which recently is yeah, getting out of fashion, let me say it in that sloppy terms. Nevertheless, in spite of all the economic and national security benefits of free trade, free trade and globalization have lost legitimacy. Why? Globalization has endangered low-skilled jobs in rich countries. Within many rich countries and some middle-income countries like China, inequality has increased significantly. In the United States, the middle 60% benefited less than either the poorest 20% or the richest 20% from income growth in the last 30 years. All of this generated dissatisfaction and resentment in rich democracies and made Trump rise to power. But in my view, resentment is also enhanced by a more general feeling. Many people, in particular older people, less educated people living outside metropolitan areas, feel overwhelmed by the speed of social change. 
they regret the disappearance of a world they have known. In my view, there are three main sources of rapid social change. First, there is technological progress. No single country can stop it. And if you try, you condemn your country to decline. This is not to be recommended. Second, there is free trade. Big countries like the United States can stop it. Worse than that, by undermining free trade, they hurt smaller and poorer countries even more than they hurt themselves. They hurt themselves, but they hurt others more than themselves. Stopping free trade reinforces poverty and promotes conflict within states and between states. We should not do it. Third, there is mass migration of unskilled people from poor countries to rich countries <coughs> and into their social transfer and safety nets. <coughs> this type of migration makes the indigenous population feel less at home in their own countries without providing benefits for both sides, migrants as well as host society. Migration must not be permitted to become an excuse for the further expansion of a bloated and ultimately unaffordable welfare state. <coughs> Migration must not be permitted to become a zero-sum game where migrants win access to generous social, wel social welfare transfers, but indigenous taxpayers lose. Like any decent commercial deal, both sides should expect to win from the deal. Of course, there are human errors, but then the deals are unlikely to be repeated. Ex ante, both sides usually expect to win. Migrants must be, mi migration should be turned from the current negative sum game into a positive sum game <coughs> where both sides win migrants as well as host society. And this means we have to stop to welcome people into social welfare and safety nets. If we can do without one of the three sources of rapid social change, technological change, free trade, and mass migration into social safety nets, I recommend that stopping the last thing is a thing to do in order to make globalization and free trade tolerable for people in rich countries and in order to safeguard our future. Thank you for your attention. So I'm with uh, Open Europe, which is a British think tank, and we have been uh, focusing on uh, Brexit heavily in the last year, given that we are a think tank which uh, wants to basically turn the European Union into um, an arrangement that mainly uh, is focused on uh, slashing national trade barriers. Now, uh, we were neutral in uh, the Brexit debate. We were not in favor or against, uh, not because we hadn't made up our mind against it, but because of our um, economic research, which basically uh, found that uh, this could be uh, a good thing for Britain, or it could actually be a bad thing, dependent on um, a number of conditions. Now, um, our three conditions for Brexit to become a good thing for the UK are that uh, the UK needs to um, be managing to uh, conclude a good free, uh, free trade deal with the EU. It needs to um, conclude a lot of trade deals with the rest of the world, secondly, and thirdly, it needs to implement um, domestic competitiveness reforms to compensate for the disruption that eventually will uh, uh, result from the Brexit process. But um, now that Brexit has happened, we are basically arguing in favor of a liberal Brexit, which um, uh, basically avoids as much trade disruption as possible as a result of, uh, of this event. Now, um, 
the media uh, have described uh, British Prime Minister uh, Theresa May's speech um, about Brexit as arguing in favour of a hard Brexit. Um, and I uh, very much uh, disagree with that. I think all the things that the UK government uh, are demanding are, are pretty obvious and completely unsurprising. Uh, for a start, the, the UK government does the UK uh, to the, it wants the UK to leave the customs union. Uh, this is not a surprise. Uh, the UK, after the Brexit vote, has been constantly reminding everyone how they want to uh, conclude trade deals with everyone in the whole world, like leaking lists of countries are happy to do so. And still, many people were somehow surprised that the UK would would uh, leave the customs union. Also, uh, unsurprisingly, um, Theresa May said that uh, she wants uh, Britain to um, be no part of the single market. And again, uh, many w uh, pretended to be uh, surprised. The Scottish are trying to, the Scottish nationalists are trying to uh, exploit this a little bit. Uh, but uh, also, this is not surprising because if Britain would be a uh, part of the cost, uh, of the internal market, it would mean that the UK, just like Norway. Uh, would copy paste all the EU rules without having a say over it, without being able yeah, to vote on it. Argument. So the the opposite would surprise. Can you imagine that the UK government say yes, we want to copy all the uh, EU's rules uh, and become uh, basically a fax democracy, as Norway was described by the current NATO Secretary General when he was a uh, Norwegian uh, Prime Minister. So this is completely unsurprising. Of course, Britain wants access. To the single market uh, as much as possible, but it will likely end up in um, an arrangement that is quite similar to uh, the Swiss EU um, arrangement. Also, the UK doesn't want uh, unrestricted freedom of movement. Eh? The the uh, um, sort of I think the, the 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 basic theme of Brexit was not so much hostility to migration, but it was hostility to unrestricted migration. Uh, the UK definitely, I mean, the, the people who were in favor of Brexit wanted to take back uh, control. That was uh, one of their uh, slogans. And um, the British government has said it definitely does not want to restrict migration too much. They have repeated that a few times, David Davis, the Brexit secretary, but they want to be able to uh, decide themselves. Uh, and uh, they don't want to um, allow this uh, to the EU framework. Now, um, what is the uh, future um, on Wednesday, so that is tomorrow, um, the UK will trigger Article 50, um, the procedure the EU has to leave. Um, this will uh, make sure that a period of two years will start, after which the UK will automatically leave, unless the spirit has been extended. Um, First, there needs to be a deal on the exit terms, and this uh, involves two main issues. First of all, the rights of European citizens in Britain. Secondly, the and, and the and the sorry, the rights of British citizens in Europe. Secondly, the money and the financial liabilities the UK has. I mean, this shouldn't be overly difficult. Uh, the EU wants Britain to pay 60. Britain wants to pay zero, so they can find such a, uh, some kind of a compromise. Both sides have openly indicated they're more than happy to guarantee that uh, anyone who is now either in the UK or in the EU 27 will be uh, allowed to stay there for the rest of their lives, and that's only fair and correct, I think. Um, the Eastern European member states um, have switched position, it seems. There's more and more signs of that, in the sense that they are expected to no longer fight very hard for their citizens to um, keep access to uh, to Britain in terms of freedom of movement. Um, and that's quite a, a game changer which hasn't been properly picked up by the media, but as a result of this uh, also freedom of movement may not uh, play a major role in Brexit negotiations. The, the main actors who are arguing in favour of open migration to the UK are uh, big companies in Britain, and, and they're absolutely right to demand sufficient um, um, right, uh, migration to, to Britain to, to uh, safeguard the labour force, uh, but uh, this has been sort of ta taken out of the EU realm and is now uh, uh, intra-British uh, political um, 
debates. Now, the big problem is that um, in two years' time, you have this cut-off point on the 1st of April 2019, when Britain will automatically leave. And in theory, then you will have uh, tariffs on trade. Um, companies uh, from Europe will, in theory, no longer be guaranteed access to the British market, and companies from Britain will, in theory, no longer be guaranteed access to the European market. So, in order to 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 deal with that, you need to uh, like basically um, agree a, a free trade deal, um, which most uh, people. Um, considered to be uh, very um, ambitious to achieve that in two years. Um, I don't think it's uh, unrealistic in theory, it's unrealistic politically. Um, politicians are not happy to just give up trade access just uh, like that. They will say it's not fair if British financial institutions can enter the EU market if they no longer automatically copy-paste all the rules and, and vice versa. Now, what will the be the outcome, because I think most people agree that at some point, maybe after 10 years, it should be possible to have a, a free trade arrangement of some sort, uh, which may impose a few restrictions on on, uh, on trade, but, but not all that bad. Uh, now, in order to bridge that um, period, um, a lot of uncertainty remains, not many people speak about it, but one outcome I see, and I'm not necessarily thinking it's the, the greatest or the best option, is that Britain would become like Norway, uh, but only temporary. Um, the advantage for the UK would be that it uh, would be able to start uh, trade, uh, negotiating trade deals right away. It would have a complex arrangement to restrict freedom of movement. Um, it would keep all access uh, to the EU market, but it would need to copy paste the EU rules and possibly also accept the jurisdiction not of the European Court of Justice but of the EFTA Court, uh, which is a bit less. It's also a supranational court, and the UK doesn't like that, but it's a bit less intrusive than the, um, than the ECJ. Um, uh, what Norway can do is it cannot say no, but it can postpone uh, the implementations of rules. Now, if you can postpone the implementations of rules coming from the EU, but this is only during a sort of a ten interim period, then you have an effective veto. I don't know if this will be acceptable to the British or even to the EU. I think the EU would accept it. Uh, the big issue will probably be the EFTA court, uh, but it could be one way out, um, because if you have to start negotiating for a f number of years, which sectors will suffer restrictions and under what conditions, then you may as well negotiate this for uh, eternity and uh, and, and um, I think that's it's quite unlikely um, so um, I think that's the discussion we're gonna see in the next um, few years um, and at the end of the day it all depends on political goodwill um, there is a lot of political goodwill but there is also uh, at least at the EU level some idea that the EU has to try to exploit this. Uh, they, they, the, 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 the main idea in Brussels is that uh, Britain, we should not punish them, but they should get a, a deal that is not as good as the current deal. And then everyone, yeah, yeah, sure, uh, they agree with that statement. Uh, and they, they think that if, if Britain doesn't get uh, a deal that is just a little bit less good than its current deal, then more countries may leave the EU. And, and most people, most government leaders agree with that. And of course, it's, it's completely wrong, uh, because any deal that Britain gets that is less good than its current deal will mean more trade disruption, uh, will mean uh, job losses on, uh, on the continent. And of course, this would uh, then only increase Euroscepticism and uh, hostility against the European Union in mainland Europe. Uh, so I think it's very important for us free traders to make uh, clear to the EU uh, that it's basically in the interest of the EU itself to uh, give a good deal to Britain that keeps trade um, as open as uh, possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. I'll hand over to John Fund uh, and let's have a look at the other side of the pond what is happening there. Thank you. A researcher recently looked at European media and books about which quotes are used the most often. And in the top 10 was the famous quote from the Spanish writer Santayana, which I'm sure you all know, 
Those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. It's at that point of penetration that a quote becomes a cliche. And a cliche is both a good thing and a not so good thing, because a cliche can be used to paper over complications. Um, one of the things that Europe has experienced the last 50 to 70 years is, of course, a long memory of the tragedy of the 20th century. Nationalism and monarchy led to World War I. Uh, in the next generation, fascism and communism almost destroyed Europe. And of course, Europeans, for very good reasons, have chosen to try to avoid these terrors at all costs. And that's why we're here in the European Parliament. But you can also overlearn the lessons of history. What is overlearning the lessons of history? It is, a, it is similar to what generals talk about. It is called fighting the last war. Not understanding that in the pace of change that we have, the lessons of history, of course, should never be disregarded. But they can become more subtle, more sophisticated, and they have to be looked at always in light of current circumstances, not just the past circumstances. And that's why we come to the phenomenon of European and American populism, uh, as indicated by the previous speakers. Here, I'm going to focus uh, not so much on personalities, but on policies. And when it comes to policies, at least in Washington, D.C., where I do much of my work, it is always best to say, watch what politicians do, not what they say. And we can certainly, in the discussion period, discuss what that means with regard to President Trump. Here's, I think, the basic phenomenon that has not been appreciated. We have had enormous economic progress, enormous success, enormous globalization, and we have created a new class of people that has not ever before been seen in such large numbers in Western countries. I call them the anywheres. That's not an original term, but um, these are the educated, mobile people who value personal individual autonomy, diversity, uh, the breaking down of class and racial barriers, all things that I think almost everyone around this table would celebrate. Those are about now a quarter of the population of all the Western democracies. They are life's winners. I submit to you that every single person in this room is not anywhere. I would be shocked if someone wasn't. But they're only a quarter of the voting population. So who's the rest? Over half in any Western country are what I call the somewheres. They are rooted in where they live and where they came from and where their ancestors were. Uh, this is not the blind nationalism of blood and soil. This is not the extreme nationalism that leads to military conflict. It is people who live, as Professor Vita mentioned, often in non-metropolitan areas. They often still go to church, as many or most anywhere don't anymore. They are rooted in family. They grew up with the nation state. They believe in the tribe, although not necessarily tribalism. They often are less educated, but they're no less sincere in their beliefs. And they're especially the belief that those who play by the rules of society should be rewarded for that. Those who adapt to society's norms should be rewarded for that. And those who break the norms, who break the consensus, who come from outside and take benefits from others, um, are looked to be viewed on not so much always as welcoming, but with some suspicion. And that's the migration issue that Professor Rita mentioned. What we have, then, is a group of people who do feel dispossessed. And the income, the income gains uh, that they have not seen the last 30 years are one aspect of that. But there's also political correctness. That while, of course, greater tolerance, a breakdown of racist and sexist and other barriers is entirely to be rewarded, for many people, this has gone too far. We all know the phenomenon of political correctness. I submit to you that political correctness was one of the major sociological reasons for the Trump phenomenon. People were just fed up with being told by people who consider themselves their betters 
you sit down, and you shut up. Well, maybe their opinions are wrong, but they in a democracy felt they had the right to their opinions. And the easiest way to win an argument in a democracy, as you know, is not to have a debate. And often in Europe, that's how you win arguments about the expansion of the European Union. You basically discredit the other side. They may even not even part of the debate. Let me give you an example that just came up yesterday. In Canada, there's a gentleman who's a doctor, a professional, and his name happens to be David Bradbury. That's his name. And for 40 years, his family has had a special government license plate because you can pay extra in Canada and the United States. You get a special license plate to commemorate some saying that you want, some place that you live in, or your name. And for 40 years, his family has had a license plate that says, grab her. That's his name. Well, he was just informed by the Canadian government he can no longer use his license plate. He must turn it in, and he must submit to the license plate XJ7542, which is a little more bureaucratic. He asked, why in the world can I not use this license plate? And he was told, I'm not making this up. Well, people will be offended and misinterpreted. Because you see, if people see a license plate that says grab her, it will mean somebody who wants to throttle or manhandle women. Grab her. So he has to lose his license plate. I submit to you down this course light and madness. And that is what people are rebelling against. Now, uh, David Goodhart, writing in the Financial <coughs> Times, is a former leftist, in fact, a very prominent leftist who used to edit liberal uh, leftist literary magazines. He has decided that we have to pay more attention to the somewheres. We don't necessarily have to agree with everything they think or all of their tendencies, but they must, their opinions must be valued and they must be paid attention to. The narrative that sees race and gender equality as a prelude to the transcendence of all exclusive unities, including the nation state, is an arrogance of breathtaking proportions, he writes. The moral equality of all human beings, the beautiful once utopian idea that became embedded in many Western constitutions, does not mean we have the same obligations to all human beings. Some people believe their obligations to others begins closer to home, and while it extends further from home, it begins closer to home. And he writes finally, this vital caveat to universalism to diversity should keep liberalism bound to the earth, to the reality of flesh and blood human beings with group attachments and the need to be valued and to belong. Of course, modern politics, the rule of law, and more recently the idea of human equality, are designed to tame and constrain our tribal, our animal, our nationalistic emotions. But if politics disappears too far into the abstractions of law and diversity, it starts to see society as just a random collection of individuals and ignores the fact that for most people at most times, the nation state is going to be a primary element in their, <coughs> in their thinking. So, of course, free trade is threatened. I don't think it's quite as threatened as Professor Rita indicates, but I think that we have to, in order to save it, we have to transcend this debate. I'll give you an example of the United States. I don't think that we're going to see a trade war with Mexico. I don't think we're going to see a trade war with Mexico, in part because I was just there giving a speech to the Cervantes Society. Uh, for example, the, one of the most successful Mexican export industries is tequila. Tequila companies in Mexico are all owned by foreigners. The biggest one, Heradura, is owned by Brown Foreman, which does Jim Beam, whiskey in Kentucky and Tennessee. I can assure you they're not in favor of uh, restrictions on trade for their Mexican tequila. Uh, and they don't believe that it threatens the sales of their Kentucky bourbon or whiskey. But we have to understand that for many people, the globalization that we have seen has led to the unequal distribution of gains that Professor Rita mentioned. So we need some creative thinking. One thought in the United States is that people move much less than they used to. We have this thinking that Americans are always looking for the next frontier. Well, that's from Westerns. Americans don't move anymore. 
Americans increasingly say where they are situated, often because their health insurance is tied to their job, uh, their assets are tied up in a house, which may or may not be easy to sell. So they increasingly tend to stay where they are. And America is a tale of two countries. There are some areas with very high unemployment, there are some areas with extremely low unemployment. But people tend not to move. And not just because of attachments of family or friends, but also because it is difficult. Well, every American who loses their job is entitled to between 26 and 52 weeks of unemployment compensation. Uh, they pay a fee during, when they are employed. That fee eventually becomes a pool of money. And when they are unemployed, they receive a weekly stipend to tie them over until they can find a new job. Right now, it's very rigid. You lose your job every week. You get a stipend, and you're supposed to look for another job, and then the money runs out. What if people could be encouraged to take that lump sum of money, the whole 26 weeks, the whole 52 weeks, and receive almost all of it in the lump sum if they agreed to move to a place of, let's say, where they might live as 10% unemployment to a place that has 2% unemployment? And what if they were, could use some of that for a job training program that has a proven standard of success in retraining people at whatever age that they have become unemployed for a new career or their old career with new skills added onto it. It's this kind of creative thinking that I think can blunt some of the thinking and the simplistic thinking that means that free trade is threatened. Because while free trade is an unalloyed good, it does lead to unequal distribution of benefits. And as Bastiat said, we can never forget the seen and the unseen. And we will never avoid the fact that the people who benefit from free trade are often invisible to us and do not have names. And the people who do not benefit from free trade often have very clear and specific names and know exactly who they are and exactly how they are becoming disadvantaged. So my appeal is, whether or not we like them, whether or not we want to associate with them, whether or not we know many of them, and many of us don't, the somewheres will always outnumber the anywheres. And no matter how many anywheres there are, in a democracy, the somewheres do count, do count, and they've just proven that in Brexit, and they've proven that in Trump's America, and they may prove it in other European countries soon enough. Thank you. I, you know, John, I loved you. You can be true. There's nothing worse than having somebody try to trump your story, this Granko thing. But I was actually in Italy last weekend, not as many of my friends thought to celebrate the EU 60th anniversary, but just one anniversary. I cannot move at all. It's the 25th of March being my wedding anniversary. My wife had always wanted me to, to take her there, so I finally found some time to do it. And uh, kind of enjoyed being, being, having our visit to the Sistine Chapel curtailed by the EU 27 leaders' private audience with the tour guide of the Pope, but that's another matter. But in the wait in the queue, my wife told me that there was a story that she picked up only that week or the previous week, which I found incredible. You know, these London road signs, you know, like a, a triangle with a red line around to warn you about certain things. We just hit the local papers, not the national papers, that there was a sign that was rapidly taken down when a Jewish man objected to it in Stanford Hill near Tottenham, which had a picture of a, a chap in a you know, Hasidic Jews with a hat. And the sign actually said, beware Jews in the streets in Tottenham. So I mean, it's quite remarkable that sort of survived 40 years. I just thought that would, uh, that would uh, interest you. Anyway, one thing that I wanted to just invite everyone to reflect on is really why does nobody talk about the banking crisis any longer? <coughs> I'm sorry. I, the banking you crisis. You have to speak up a bit. Sorry. Yeah, there is no microphone, sorry. It's okay. Just yeah. speak up. I can shout, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the last time I was, I was honoured to be invited to speak was actually in Belgrade in 2014 when I had the pleasure of following uh, Professor Vida then. And, uh, at that stage, I sensed that concerns about the banking crisis were starting to abate. If I can take you back to 2009, we were all worried about the banking crisis then. Central banking, huge concerns about the independence of central banks, the conveyor belt, uh, the revolving door rather, out of Goldman Sachs' office into major positions, administering the TARP bailouts, dragging himself, just about getting into the full swing of things at the ECB. And yet, I think really that the, 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 um, the, the concern I have for the next generation especially this swathe of prime ministers and leaders that, that have swept into Rome when I was there on, on Saturday. 16 of them younger than me. <laughs> Most of them studying when banks had collapsed. 
is that, is that they've just accepted as, as the norm that we live in a dystopian environment where banking simply doesn't work. I was planning, therefore, to talk a little bit about, about, about events that have happened since, since 2009, 2014, just to update you on the report I gave then about Monty Pasky and how Hatcher attempted to prove the central bankers simply have no idea what exposures the banks have because of the ways the modern techniques that I confess I became a bit of a specialist in, in structuring exposures in such a way that they have never reported on books of either bank. And then finally, I wanted to uh, to just revert to uh, Professor Bader's papers. He sent me a couple of papers, asked for them, 2014. This one I found quite impressive. 2004, the diffusion of prosperity and peace by globalization. The, the key point of that I took away when I read it was that capitalism is essential for global peace. That's one of your main themes, Professor. And in a nutshell, it's a quite a long paper, but there are three points that jump out. That a, capitalist, a capitalist peace strategy presupposes a minimal degree of state effectiveness. And my conclusion really is that the way governments are behaving regarding the banking crisis proves that that standard, sadly, is never going to be made. Secondly, a capitalist peace strategy will not work in the Muslim world. I think events way after 2014 have demonstrated that with ISIS. And thirdly, Professor Vedder cautions us to keep in mind the limits of social science. It's nearly probabilistic, so there is some doubt about this. But I have to take my hat off to you, Professor, for having had the foresight to write that paper 13 years ago, and I look forward to the update next year. So to put a bit of flesh on the bones of that, a few updates. Um, also, sorry, before that, to pick up on Peter's point, thanks you, haven't yet gone to Austria, Peter, about Scotland. I don't know if many people rather realise that Scotland, my father, uh, nice to see the Cross of St Andrews around the town this morning, <laughs> is probably the most insolvent country in Europe. You know, way in excess of Greece and everything else. The trade deficit is 10%. They kept uh, alive on life support. I actually, so I'm going to name drop a bit here, I just have to. I had, I had lunch with Murdo Fraser about four weeks ago, three weeks ago. He's the, he's the you know, one of the close lieutenants of Ruth Davison, the leaders of the Scottish Conservatives. And he's the, he's, you know, he's the kind of finance minister representative. And he gave a talk to me, 10 other guys, at lunch, and was saying that he thinks that uh, uh, he, this is before the demand came in from Sturgeon for a referendum. He thinks that, uh, that the position of the Scottish Conservatives will be to oppose any Scottish referendum before the Brexit deal is negotiated. And I just said to him, yeah, well, why are you saying that? No, no, no. Do you not see you're putting yourself right back into this position of somebody in the elite who fully admits that the reason that he and his colleagues take that stance is because they're worried that the Scots might vote the wrong way. You know, it's not a very healthy policy to adopt these days. But uh, um, I asked him at the time to change his policy immediately if he wanted to ensure that the Scottish Conservatives do better. Although, I, for the interest of full disclosure, I had no political affiliation at all and never will have. I just thought it was interesting that he was making, I thought, a wrong policy decision for his own names. I thought he should encourage Ruth Davidson to call for an immediate referendum, precisely in the circumstances of Brexit uncertainty before this Brexit deal is done, which I think will probably take 10 years. But just briefly, because I know we're short of time. Some updates since I was last invited to speak. In RBS 2011, I was in the room with Steve Baker, who was quite prominent in Brexit, David Davis, now the Brexit Minister, three of the top guys from RBS who responded to a press release, one of my famous blogs, which luckily for me, Steve Baker republished, which accused RBS of falsifying its accounts to the tune of 23 billion. That, that is understating losses by 23 billion and therefore exaggerating their tier one capital. And of course, these numbers are quite significant because in 23 billion, it's a big, big number, that would have been about two or three percent of their claim capital at the time. And, uh, and obviously, we've shown RBS is overtly insolvent. Well, the good news is that now, RBS's shares having rallied and now fallen again, and they're currently standing at a price to book of 50%. No major bank in the world has ever recovered from such a low price to book ratio, so the market doesn't believe this on it. Secondly, um, actually, the Bank of England, we have kept close to Steve Baker, and I don't think many people know this because the press reported it so badly, but a couple of weeks ago, the um, number two of the Bank of England was forced to resign over over failure to disclose a conflict of interest. It was not a financial one, it was, it was one of major 
phones one, I'm not sure, but it was, it was about deliberately not stating in the form that her brother was senior guy in the bank she was regulating. And it's quite interesting that this, this, this played out all the way through the internal discipline process of the Bank of England. The court of the Bank of England, wonderful term, you know, by some kind of sovereignty. And she was passed all the way through. It was only the actions of the independent Treasury Select Committee, 12 guys of which I think Steve Baker, Jacob Rees Morgan, and Chairman Tyree are probably the most prominent, that they, they put pressure on her and she was forced to resign a second time and demand that it be accepted. Um, third item is Unicredit. I'm indebted to Pierre Garella for continuing to pass my, 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 uh, my blogs and newsletters on the board of IRF, but he, he'll be aware that uh, last month we published one which analyzed, I'm grateful to some of my colleagues here, the rights issue perspectives of Union Credit was 1,100 pages long in Italian. And, uh, and in a nutshell, I urge you to read it. Union Credit's false accounting for the rights issue is at such a level it makes Bernie Madoff's activities look like Mother Teresa. Uh, two things highlights of it are as follows. Firstly, they have, they have published their financial results. As of the 3rd of March 2017, the latest date for subscription, they published their year-end 2015, then they also published their September 2016 results. They didn't publish their year-end 2016 results. And at first I thought, why was that? Then we looked very closely and found out that they, that they took a write-off of 12.2 billion euros between October and December 2016. And possibly, investors might have been slightly slower to commit to the 13 billion rights issue cash for injection had they known the 12.2 of that 13 had already been written off. It was deliberately helped with help from the prospectus. Then another little trick they do is that they, they classified the new shares, because we were expecting a bit of boring accounting here, how to clear the room quickly for lunch, that we were expecting it to be an astonishingly large share discount account. That's a term that might be foreign to even, even, even politicians, but of course the normal structure of a share issue is that you have a share issue at say you know, 10 euro cents trading at one euro, so the way that's accounted for is that the 90 goes into the books as a share premium account, and the actual capital constituting the 81, whatever you call it, is the sum of the two. But of course here, the number of shares in issue that had to be issued to attract the, the eight euros in this time were so many gazillions that what they've actually done to avoid creating a huge share discount account, which would have prompted even the incredibly sorry, John, not you, but dumb journalists to realise that Unicredit is so overtly and solidly can never come back, was they, they basically classified the, the they, they, they deemed the, um, uh, the normal value to be one euro cent to create a false share premium account later away, and then call these shares fungible with the others. I'm getting, getting the signal, so I'm going to wind up. But uh, basically, that, those things just lead me to the conclusion that it's now obvious that the euro will fracture. Once, once, once Germany wakes up to the fact that Italy is now doing these kinds of things and then parceling all the non-performing lines in the way, they can transfer them to the ECB for freshly printed euros, they're not going to have it. Thank you very much, Gordon. Well, I would, may I, may I raise one and I simply ask, uh, there is the, the myth in, in continental Europe that Britain will not be able to deal with anybody outside, you know, because the major uh, deal trades, uh, trading is with, with the EU. Uh, this is wrong. But uh, are there facts, figures, numbers that maybe Open Europe has, that Gordon has, that you would like to share with us? And uh, would you like to make a hint of that the former Commonwealth was a big trade partner, and the, they obviously had some difficulties while being members of the EU. Is this a myth, or is this true? I mean, these are just things that you know we heard last week at the roadshow in Southeast Europe. So, could you clarify on that? Uh, yeah. So. Um Britain will do two things. It will, uh, first of all, try to replicate any uh, trade deal the European Union had with any third country, like, for example, with, with Canada, which is now uh, being implemented. So then uh, Britain will also then need to have a trade deal with Canada. That's one thing. And then secondly, it will try to uh, conclude trade deals with uh, third countries that uh, you did not have a, a trade deal with. Now, we don't have any facts or figures on that. We only have statements of politicians like uh, the Australian uh, leader or um, Theresa May, I think, also visit India. And generally, um, also Donald Trump 
uh, has been, they all have been very positive about the prospect of concluding a trade deal, but of course then in practice to negotiate it, this will um, probably uh, take quite a few years, I think, uh, given that it's not free trade, but managed trade, with all the interest groups jumping on it, as always. Um, so yeah, it's not much more uh, complicated than that, so I think in the long term, in any case, the UK will be fine, but the big challenge is how to deal with the, 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 the cut-off point after two years and how to deal with uh, the fact that it will take uh, a certain amount of time to, to actually conclude all these uh, trade deals. Wait a minute. Um, the, until now, it was always the um, opinion that you couldn't even pronounce the word less Europe. It was always more Europe. And, and you were a fool or made a fool when you said that. Given that uh, there are countries around this, the, the center of Europe, like the, the northern Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands and so on, who could support this point of view, we now miss the UK because they are just choosing for themselves. And that is what I blame them. What is your reply to that? I think it's um, it's a it's a fair point, and as a Flemish free marketeer, I will definitely miss uh, yeah. the British in the EU institutions to fight uh, the wrong status quo. That's that's true. On the other hand, you can also see that Brexit does uh, bring about a lot of uh, soul searching. First of all, Jean Claude Juncker mentioned in his five options for the yeah, future I of the EU, that, that uh, the EU doing less and the EU only becoming a, yeah, a mere tree free yeah. arrangement was a, was a possible option. Then you see that Germany, the German government, has said that the EU budget needs to be cut um, as a result of, uh, uh, of Brexit. Um, that's also, I think, um, new. Uh, but I also heard that uh, ministers in meetings are, are more keen to say no, uh, sort of the sense of inevitability that we need to have this particular EU rule is sort of is sort of gone. So, um, you know, one member has left the club because they think the club is a little too aggressive and out of touch. So this, um, you know, has led to a little bit of soul searching, not enough, of course, but I'm just saying that there are some positive uh, aspects um, also for the free marketeers in the EU 27. Uh, as a result of, uh, of of the Brexit, well, I'm John an and then Pierre. Well, I'm an outsider, but uh, I've been searching for that soul that they were looking for. I think it's microscopic. Uh, I think there's very little rethinking in the aftermath of Brexit. Um, this phrase "more Europe, never less Europe" is a great phrase, but it falls into the cliche category. It disguises more than it reveals. Uh, my response, if I had to simplify it, would be, of course more Europe, and fewer bureaucrats, and fewer straitjackets, and fewer restrictions. A few rules. All those well, legislation. Well, well, rules, rules can be oh good and God. rules can be bad. I mean, the rule of law, of course. Year. <laughs> I understand that. All I'm saying is, uh, you know, language is important, and I don't want to be against all rules. I do think that from an outsider's perspective, uh, the Europeans should understand one thing. The conditions that led to Britain to vote to leave the EU are prevalent in all European countries. And if I were an EU bureaucrat, I would sit down and ask myself, how confident am I that I can forever hold off another country holding a referendum on European Union membership? Because as we know, every time the EU has taken its vote to the people, with the exception of the bribe in Ireland, where after that, I think I got it in the third try after they bribed me so much. They've always lost. They always lose a referendum when they make the mistake of having one. So my view is, how long can they forestall another referendum in another country and be completely confident that they would win it? I don't think they can. So I think their current strategy, as an outsider's perspective, is make sure they never vote again because it's like the Hotel California. You can check in, you can't check out. <laughs> Thank you, Ken, and the gentleman in the back. Yeah, I mean, that was a question to John. I mean, you mentioned free trade, you know, might make people, I mean, some people lose from, from, you know, from the dynamic of the economy. And, and, and then you mentioned the fact that uh, in the U.S., one of the things that people don't, 
know, the labor don't move as well as before. Uh, and then you've got that idea of maybe, you know, using the, the unemployment benefit to, to help these people to move, you know, let the, letting them free to use that money the way they want. And, and by the way, then you, you mentioned they have like about 24 weeks or 26. 20, between 26 and 50. Which is 26 months in France, of course, but, but you know, that's <laughs> just uh, different. Between, now, but, so, but, but this triggers a question, so you know, 26 weeks, that's not a huge amount of money. So if, if, if my problem is with a house that will lose its value, uh, you know, would that help? And, and what, so, so my question, but it's, uh, is, uh, what is the situation of the housing market in, in the U.S. after 2008? I mean, it's, uh, I mean, is this a, a, a consequences of the mess of 2008 and uh, the subprime bubble? I mean, why don't people, I mean, wh why can't they just, you know, sell their house or rent it or? And, and isn't more on that side that we should look upon instead of you know twenty months of wages and salary? That well, small. first of all, our unemployment system varies from state to state. In yeah, that, some that, states, that, yeah. in some states, I'm a Californian. It's extremely generous. Okay. So it depends on the state, and in some states it can be up to fifty-two weeks, which is a year. Uh, the housing market is an issue. Uh, it's highly variable depending on where you live. Some people bought their house at the top of the market in 2006, 2007, that value is not going to be coming back in their lifetime. So if it's their primary asset, uh, they may feel stuck or they may feel unwilling to take that loss. On the other hand, the housing market is stabilized in many places. And even though there's a perception that it's difficult to sell your house, that may not be in accord with reality. Uh, my view is that so long as we've had a Federal Reserve, which has artificially propped up uh, equities, and indirectly, I think, kept down real wage growth, you have an imbalance. Uh, what has happened in the last 10 years since the banking crisis in the United States is if you have stocks, you're doing extremely well, and if you earn wage income, you're doing very poorly. And that has exacerbated the inequality under Barack Obama, which he claimed to be fighting against. In fact, Barack Obama was the leading instigator of greater economic inequality in the United States. I've got a question for this professor, but I think you might be very passionate uh, speech about free trade, I'm also for free trade, but uh, you, you said that there is also negative impact. And I think you downplayed it a little bit. In the, thank you for mentioning Federal Reserve and Central Banks uh, printing money. I think in the, in the, in the basically world that we live in, when you've got uh, nominal, nominal, let's say, wage inflation, then you've got labor laws, uh, basically all, all the job is basically outsourced to China, to, 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 to in Southeast Asia. In this case, basically laborers, people that basically once the real wage goes down because of what, what central banks is doing, second, they basically lose the job because job is outsourcing. Uh, how, how can you be in this, basically, in, in this environment, how can you so passionately defend the free trade? Basically, can, can free trade, do we have a free trade, first of all, with, with central banking setting the interest rate wherever they want and, and printing billions, trillions of dollars? But it, is it, it doesn't it even make sense to defend free trade because free trade hurts normally, normal, ordinary workers. The thing about free trade is a little bit more complicated. The, the complication arises from the fact that the only place where real free trade happens is textbooks. Because the kind of trade which we observe is never real free trade. Because from the point of view of benefits to consumers, and that's the place where we should look, because consumers are not specialized. Producers in general are specialized. Either you give lectures in social science like me, or you bake bread, or you mend cars, but nobody does all these things together. But consumers are not specialized, so the easiest way to approach the problem is look to the benefit of consumers. And if that is your main concern, what we should aim at would be unilateral free trade. And if Every nation which wants free trade decides to go unilaterally for free trade, all the bureaucratic regulations would be unnecessary. And what we have is not global free trade, 
but is we have regional free trade pacts, and that generates a problem of trade diversion. So all regional free trade pacts, including the European free trade area or the European common market, or the failed attempt to generate the North Atlantic free trade area, all that at best was something like a second best solution. And then it's far too bureaucratic because we have all these rules of origin. You see, exporters have to make sure that not too much of what they want to export has been produced in a third country and all that thing. So the free trade which we, which we observe is over bureaucratic. But then the question is, we don't live in a first best world. We do not, if the second best free trade world is under threat, and I think it is under threat, should we try to fight against the third best world? And my fear is that things like Brexit or Trump's protectionism will make trade regulation even more complicated and therefore even worse than it currently is. So I'm afraid that in spite of the fact that we are already in a mess and that free trade is too far from the ideal, we are likely to move even further away from the ideal and from a rational construction. But even in a rational world, we have to admit that free trade, in essence, increases competition. And competition necessarily generates losers, not only winners. That is true for domestic competition, and it's true for international competition. And the hard question is what to do about the losers. And in the discussion before, I suggested one way to mitigate the frustration of the losers is to get the migration problem under control. And John Fund made other suggestions about how we should try to conciliate the somewheres in a world ruled by the anywheres. So I think from a different angel, we address the same problem. And the problem which we have essentially is that we face a crisis of legitimacy of our economic order. And this has arisen, John Fund again said it, because the benefits are not as visible because they are dispersed and the costs are concentrated and therefore all too visible. And that, of course, generates some animosity against free trade and Trump used it in order to gain power. So there are many problems and I probably should not try to make my response even longer than it was.